Hello and welcome to our Power and Conflict revision video. Now I made this video for two reasons. The first is for the students who've been following this course so far. Now we've gone through all 15 poems and we've discussed context related to each of the poets. In addition, we've gone into lots of detail when it comes to understanding each poem and what each key lines mean and also techniques as well as structure, form and so on. However, what I thought this would be useful for, especially if you're part of that group of students, is for you to take a step back essentially and to see how did all 15 poems fit as an entire picture, but also if we were to really narrow down the quotations that you need to remember, what would that look like? However, the second reason why I made this video is for students who don't necessarily have the luxury of time. So you might be on some form of time pressure, you might have an essay to submit very soon, or you might be having your exams quite soon and you need something that goes straight to the heart of the matter, which essentially points you in the right direction in terms of key quotations to remember, what to memorise, and essentially gives you an overview of all 15 poems. Now, before we move on to the next video where I give you a detailed walkthrough of each exam question and how to answer it, I think it would be really useful to get an idea of how all the quotations look like when you cut it down and when you summarise each of the poems for your revision. Because remember, these are 15 poems, meaning if you even just remembered two key quotations for each poem, that would make it 30. So you have to be quite economical with the poetry quotes that you choose and I've done that for you. So let's get started and we'll begin with the first poem in this collection which is Ozymandias. Now in terms of Ozymandias the first thing to always remember is that it's written in a sonnet form. Traditionally a sonnet is a love poem which is 14 lines in length and essentially Percy Shelley has used this as a way to mock the person who is the subject of this poem. So Ozymandias is written about King Ramesses II contextually and you should know this from other parts of the video and essentially the sonnet is written in a very ironic sense. Now in terms of the key quotations to remember from this poem the first quote to remember is shattered visage and this describes essentially the shattered and broken face of the statue of King Ramesses, this man who thought he'd always be remembered for centuries to come. Actually, nature doesn't really care for him. It's destroyed his statue. And the second quotation to remember is lone and level sands. And this shows, ironically, it's the little beads of sand, the desert and nature that have destroyed this man who thought he was really powerful and indestructible. Let's move on to the second poem in this collection, which is London. And in terms of structure, it's an A, B, A, B structure. And the first quotation to remember is chartered street. And the term chartered, this adjective, is really powerful because it shows the unnatural act of trying to control something that shouldn't be controlled. Streets, and of course also the chartered Thames, the chartered river, they shouldn't be controlled. However, it's showing just how controlling the monarchy and the government is. And the second quotation, which ends the poem, is Marriage Hearse, which is an oxymoron. Again, this shows how new life, the, even the start of new life in London, in William Blake's London, is destroyed immediately, and there's not very much hope in such a corrupt city. Now, the next poem in this collection is The Prelude, and in terms of the structure or the form it's written, it's written in free verse. Free verse just means that the poem doesn't necessarily follow a very set rhyme scheme, it's written with a more free-flowing way. Now, in terms of quotations from Prelude, the first is Troubled Pleasure, which is an oxymoron. It shows that the person who's stolen this boat and he's gone out to the water, it, he knows that he's not supposed to be doing this, it's a forbidden act. And the second quotation is upreared its head. The mountain is being personified as a really scary monster. And the third quotation, which ends the poem, is trouble to my dreams. This shows that the poet has essentially crossed over to understand in terms of nature, just how scary and how powerful nature is. But, and this has been something that's a revelation that has really, really thrown him aback. And he's really, really troubled. He gets nightmares about this. The next poem in this collection is My Last Duchess, and in terms of the way it's written, it's a dramatic monologue. Now, in terms of quotation, the first one, of course, use to make it easier for you, uh, he uh, refers to his duchess as My Last Duchess. The second quotation is dies along her throat. Of course, this shows and this gives us hints that essentially this man who sees her as his possession, he calls her my last duchess. He also shows how he perhaps has killed his duchess as a way of controlling her. And the final quotation is smiles stopped. And it shows, of course, that the Duke was so jealous of the duchess and he was so wi willing to exercise power and control over her that he ultimately had her killed. 
Now the next poem in this collection is Charge of the Light Brigade and in terms of the way it's written, it's written into six stanzas. Now the first quotation to remember which is repeated is half a league and this describes the British troops and the size of the British troops and how of course they were going to be outnumbered. The second quotation is they rode into the valley of death. This is a biblical reference to Psalms and essentially it shows just how again it's conveying these men even if they lost this battle they were still triumphant in our memory and in history and also they were triumphant because they were just so brave and the third quotation is shot and shell and this sibilance is used to show just how brutal this killing was of this light brigade now the next uh, poem in this collection is exposure in terms of rhyme scheme it is a B, B, A, C rhyme scheme and in terms of quotations to remember from exposure the first is but nothing happens which is repeated continuously do remember that of course this conveys a soldier's experience during the first world war and it's showing actually a lot of the war was comprised of a lot of waiting and waiting in the cold which is what killed a lot of these soldiers it was nature that killed a, a lot of these soldiers the second thing of course which ties into nature and the power of nature and the harshness of nature is dawn massing her melancholy army which shows that nature is essentially attacking these soldiers nature is the enemy the next poem is storm on the island and it is written in free verse now in terms of quotations the first is wise and earth now this is describing how the people who are preparing for this storm they're digging into the wise and earth which gives us the idea that this earth is very um very it's been there for a long time it's probably going to be there and outlast these people after they die however it's also interesting because it contrasts to this very kindly description of the earth which is wise contrast how it pummels them so this is the sea that pummels them so uh, one thing that this poem wants to show is that we can't underestimate the power of nature now the final quotation to remember is exploding comfortably this is an oxymoron it describes the sea which seemingly doesn't seem to be very threatening but actually it has the power innate within it to destroy the entire island now the next poem in the collection is Bayonet Charge and it's written in free verse. Now in terms of quotations to remember, the first is patriotic tear dot 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 like molten iron this describes how this soldier as he's running into this charge he's really fearful however he has a tear where he's remembering why he's doing this and this uh, uh, simile rather is really really powerful because essentially what this is showing is how he's really propelled and impelled by this wish to serve for his country however this wish gets further and further and further away as his sheer survival and even his sheer mortality stares him in the face and this is brought to full circle in the final stanza when these three are listed this is the rule of three king honor human dignity this rule of three is used in order to show how these ideas that led all of these men into the war actually become luxuries. They become these general ideas in the face of their deaths and they automatically forget about it when faced with death. Now the next poem in the collection to be aware of is of course Remains and this is written in free verse. Now in terms of quotations the first is probably armed, possibly not. Of course this is showing that the man that's going to be killed was actually an innocent civilian. The second quotation, of course, we know that the person the narrator is speaking is really haunted by this um, act that he engaged in with other men. He killed an unarmed civilian, so he's really haunted by this. And he remembers this because he says, his bloody life in my bloody hands. And the repetition of the word bloody essentially emphasizes just how guilty and how haunted the soldier feels after what he's done. Now, the next poem is Poppies and it's written in free verse and in terms of quotations to remember from poppies the first is flattened rolled turned into felt to describe the woman and how she feels and also the next quotation is released a songbird from its cage it describes how the woman the mother of the soldier she almost feels like she has let her son go almost like the way you can have a bird which she loves so much but you have to release it from its cage and we get the sense that maybe her son has died in battle and the final quotation is war memorial of course this is reminding us of armistice sunday this is reminding us of the sacrifice of a lot of soldiers in world war one but also more generally the sacrifice that a lot of soldiers make in order that our countries can enjoy freedom now the next poem is 
war photographer and in terms of how it's written it's a sestet in other words it's written in six line stanzas now in terms of quotations the first is spools of suffering so caroline duffy uses a lot of metaphors related to photography and of course in terms of spools this is the water that the photograph when it's developed so this is a very old school method of developing photographs they're put in water however what is being developed by this particular war photographer are images of people who are going through a lot of suffering now the next quotation is to do with cities that have been impacted by war belfast in northern ireland and beirut in lebanon and the final quotation is a hundred agonies and this hyperbole essentially shows the suffering that a lot of people have to endure around the world and we in england and in places of great peace in the western world don't even understand or can't even comprehend the extent of this suffering now the next poem in this collection is tissue and it's written in free verse and in terms of quotations the first is smoothed and stroked and turned and this describes the quran how this uh, this religious text is so when she looks at the sheets of paper it's so red and so overused that it's become very thin with time and age now the next quotation is maps two and this is a full sentence with caesura and again this shows that even if paper is quite flimsy it has the power to shape borders and to shape countries and ultimately identities and of course the final quotation is turned into your skin the power of paper to shape all of us in terms of how we use money how we even read religious texts which shapes our religion but equally how ultimately this shape turns into our own culture it shapes maps it shapes the countries that we live in and obviously tissue the main message is just the power of paper which paradoxically is quite weak you can rip up paper but it's still so powerful now the next poem in this collection is the emigre and it's written in two octaves octaves means eight line stanzas and then the final stanza because it's just three stanzas the final one is nine lines so an extra line has been added now the key quotations to remember is there once was a country and there's ellipsis there and what this does is it shows how the narrator has this really romanticized image of her country almost like a fairy tale the next quotation is sick with tyrants the country is personified as being destroyed by its leaders and the final quotation is i comb its hair now the narrator is still unperturbed by all of this horrible news that they hear about the country they still see it in their mind as this beautiful woman who they really lovingly care for now the next poem is kamikaze and it's written in free verse now in terms of quotation the first is fishes flashing silver and the alliteration this is what the pilot who was supposedly on a suicide mission he sees them as he's in the plane below and this makes him realize the beauty of nature and it makes him start changing his mind as to whether he wants to go through with this suicide mission the next quotation is the turbulent inrush and this in many ways reflects the pilot's own turbulent feelings as they're wondering whether they have a bigger duty to the country to engage successfully in this suicide mission which would mean death or they have a bigger duty to stay alive and to be with their family. Now, the final poem is Checking Out My History by John Agard. And again, it's written in free verse. Now, in terms of how it's written, it's really interesting because it's written phonetically. In other words, the person who writes this, the narrator, is supposedly of Caribbean descent. Hence, they speak using an accent called patois. And thus, it's written to reflect that accent. And so the first thing that's written quite phonetically is Dem Tell Me. And he repeats this consistently and this shows his anger at how when he's living in England and he's trying to go through the educational system, he's only being told a very one-sided part of history rather than learning the entirety of history, which includes not only English and American history, but also history that includes Caribbean figures as well as African figures. And he's really angry that it doesn't necessarily include that. Now the next quotation is bandage up me eye and essentially what he means here is that the British educational system is essentially blinding him to his own history and it's only teaching him one side of history. And the final quotation is Toussaint and then I've put uh, ellipsis here and then Napoleon. So he juxtaposes very very famous white historical figures like Napoleon Bonaparte from France. However he juxtaposes that with also historic black African and Caribbean figures such as Toussaint Louverture who essentially was a slave that led a rebellion which established the first black republic in the world which was Haiti. Now of course that is it with regards to understanding
the key quotations from all 15 poems. I hope you found this useful and also don't forget as part of this course this will be available for download so don't worry too much if you haven't ma managed to write down all of this. I will, I'm going to make it available for download in this course so just make sure you download the PDF file. Thank you so much for listening.